At the end of the service today, you will find out who the new senior pastor will be. Therefore, it is a good day to recognize the people who do most of the work of ministry in this church and in our community, and that is you. We are recognizing all our volunteers today. And you've served in lots of different ways, teaching Sunday school, doing mission work, serving as an usher or greeter, singing in the choir, working on a committee, counting money, folding bulletins, visiting the sick, tutoring, facilitating a small group, chaperoning youth, chairing fundraisers, working on buildings, preparing delicious goodies like Joy did today in your honor. You may have volunteered with a mission ministry or a church or with a nonprofit serving in the community. For example, Caritas, Resurrection House, Goodwill, Salvation Army, Day for Hope, Meals on Wheels, Spark, Family Promise, Be a Blessing, Ukrainian Support Group, local schools or service clubs, visiting people in our sister churches in Cuba, and one of our members, Peggy Hyde, right now is visiting the orphans that we support in Zimbabwe. Remember her in your prayers. We want to recognize you. And so if you've served this congregation or other congregations in any of those ways or other ways, would you please stand? If it's difficult to stand, just raise your hand. Thank you for your service. May God bless each one of you. Let's pray together. Lord, here are your hands and feet. We thank you for these who have faithfully served you in so many different ways. We honor them. Continue to bless them and use them in your kingdom. Multiply the good that they do. Inspire others to follow their example. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. In a small town in Indiana, squirrels occupied the attics of the Presbyterian, the Catholic, and the Methodist churches. The churches were all on the main street. Big trees lined that street. And the squirrels were a nuisance and even destructive, chewing insulation and gnawing on wires. Each congregation called a meeting to deal with the pests. The Presbyterians met first, but they adjourned very soon because an elder pointed out that the squirrel invasion was preordained, and theologically there was nothing they could do about it. The Catholics met next. The priest said that it was so bad that he had had a nightmare that the squirrels had taken over the church. He was in favor of poisoning them. Then a kind old woman pleaded with the congregation, to handle the problem in the gentle spirit of St. Francis of Assisi. He used to preach to the squirrels and the other creatures. So the church bought a bunch of humane traps, took the squirrels out in the country, and turned them loose. The next morning, all the Catholic squirrels were back in the Catholic attic. The Methodists were the last to convene a meeting. Because of declining membership, radical action was taken. It was voted to baptize the squirrels and make them members of the church. (laughs) The squirrels never came back. (laughs) Except for a few on Christmas and Easter. Our passage contains the Great Commission. Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Our main mission in the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Reverend John MacArthur tells a parable that may relate to the Great Commission and the church. On a dangerous sea coast, where shipwrecks were frequent, a crude little rescue station was built. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat, but the few devoted crewmen kept a constant watch over the sea. With no thought for themselves, when they went out day or night, whenever there was a shipwreck along the coast, 
They tirelessly search for any survivors in the water, and they save many lives by their devoted efforts. After a while, the station became famous. Some of those who were saved, as well as others in the surrounding area, wanted to participate in the work. They gave time and money to support it. New boats were bought. Additional crews were trained, and the station grew. Some of the members became unhappy that the building was so crude. They felt a larger, nicer place would be more appropriate as the first refuge for those who've been saved from the sea. So they built a larger building. They replaced the emergency cots with hospital beds and purchased nice furniture. Soon the station became a popular gathering place for its members to discuss the work and visit with each other. They continued to remodel and decorate until the station more and more took on the look of a club. Fewer members were interested in going out on rescue missions, so they hired professional crews to do the work for them. The rescue motif still prevailed on the club emblems and stationery, and there was a model lifeboat in the room where people were initiated into the club. One day, a large shipwreck occurred off the coast, and the hired crews brought in many boatloads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty, bruised, and sick. They were all foreigners who did not speak English. The beautiful new club was terribly messed up, so the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside where the shipwreck victims could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's rescue activities altogether. They felt they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. A minority of members insisted on keeping rescue as their primary purpose. They pointed out that after all, they were still called a rescue station. But those members were voted down. The majority told them that if they wanted to save lives, they could begin their own rescue station down the coast, and that's what they did. As the years passed, the new station gradually faced the same problems the first one had experienced. It too became a club, and its rescue work became less and less of a priority. The few members who remained dedicated to life-saving began another station. History continued to repeat itself. If you visit that coast today, you will find several exclusive clubs along the shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, but most people drown. From a spiritual perspective, could it be that this parable of MacArthur's of a rescue station describes what's been happening in the churches in the United States? Is the modern church in America making disciples? The latest statistics show a significant decline in attendance in Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox churches. How are we doing? This church's attendance grew by 17% 17, 17 last year for in-person worship and held steady online. Thank you for your faithfulness in worship. The Gallup organization reported that in the year 2000, 70% of Americans belonged to a church, synagogue, or mosque. The most recent poll showed only 47% of Americans belong to one. A huge decline. Now less than half of our population. Mosques and synagogues have grown, while churches have declined. About 30% of Americans have no religious affiliation. That is a huge increase in the last two decades. How are we doing here at First Church Sarasota? In 2023, we welcomed 46 new members. 46 of you joined this church. Some reaffirmed your faith. Some professed your faith for, for the first time. And a few transferred from other congregations. Most of the people who become members of this church and other churches are already disciples of Jesus Christ. What about making disciples of persons who are part of that 30% of Americans with no religious affiliation? That is a much harder task but it's part of our commission as disciples of Jesus. P. 
Peter, Andrew, James, and John left their fishing business and became followers of Jesus. They became students of Jesus, apprentices. Being a disciple means learning what your teacher says and following his example. A disciple of Jesus learns to think like he does, to value what he does, and to act like Jesus. It was assumed that one day the disciple of a rabbi might become a rabbi. A student of the teacher would become a teacher. Is that what Jesus expects from us? Are we to become mentors for others as they become apprentices of Jesus? In the church, we all have different roles. Not everyone is called to be a teacher. We serve together as a team with our main purpose, making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This great commission in Matthew's gospel states that a follower obeys Jesus' commands. What are Jesus' commands? Jesus taught you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Loving God is a matter of the heart and is reflected in our behavior. We summarize some of what we do as disciples in our membership vows. When we join the United Methodist Church, we say we commit to prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Today, we are celebrating the service to the Lord, your service in our church, in our community. As we serve In the church and community, we demonstrate our love for God and for one another. Our witness in serving speaks louder than anything we could say. Our main task is to make disciples, and serving others is a key to accompanying, to accomplishing that goal. Recent research shows that when practicing Christians are looking for a church, the number one thing they are looking for is quality sermons. Number two is traditional worship. And number three is friendly people. We could boil that down to good hymn singing, friendly people, and quality sermons. We have wonderful music, and you are such a friendly group of people. Sermons, well, two out of three is not bad. (laughs) Most people attend a church because someone invited them. Some of you are great at inviting others to our church family. And when people come, we teach them. We're making disciples through our teaching ministry. Besides sermons, we disciple people in Sunday school classes for adults and children. Women's groups focus on learning more about how to live as followers of Jesus and how to do good in the community. Our music director, Michael, brings in children and young people to teach them music and about God's love for them. Bible studies focus on learning about the scriptures and how to apply them to our lives. Becoming a disciple of Jesus is a lifelong process. We we grow in God's grace as we mature in Christ. But what about reaching that 30% of those with no church affiliation? It might be helpful to listen to what they say about why they aren't disciples of Jesus. According to a December 2023 study, the top seven reasons people give for not being religious are 52% they say they don't trust organized religion, 48% say they don't trust religious leaders and don't think religion is relevant to their lives, 46% say religious people are too judgmental, 42% say religion is too focused on money. 41% are disillusioned with religion, and 40% don't believe in God. These are the most common reasons of the top 25 that that are cited for not participating in church. Lack of trust is the key. Not trusting churches, not trusting pastors or priests, and not trusting God. The challenge for us in making disciples is to show that we are trustworthy. We are to be honest, consistent, and transparent as possible with others. We cannot pretend to be better than we are, and we don't look down on anyone else as being less than we are in any way. 
being open and vulnerable in our conversations can lead others to trust us. We can be ourselves and be real with others. Jenny Wheeler was raised in a family that never professed faith nor went to church. She became a teacher and married Lee. Eleven years later, they had their first child, Kathy. When Kathy got old enough for preschool, Jenny researched the neighborhood and discovered the best one in town was at a neighborhood church. After a few months at preschool, Kathy came home one day and asked her mother why they never went to Sunday school. The next Sunday, the Wheeler family attended worship. They were pleasantly surprised at the wonderful welcome and meaningful worship. In time, they joined. Jenny volunteered to teach Sunday school and discovered that she knew nothing about the Bible herself. So in addition to teaching, she enrolled in disciple Bible study. Excited about learning the faith, she started telling cousin Janet and her husband Don about it at dinner. They also decided to attend, even though Don had never been inside a church building. Jenny began sharing her faith in positive ways with others too, parents at the soccer field and mothers at Girl Scouts. When Kathy's friends came over to spend Saturday night, they were invited to worship with the Wheelers the next day. Some of the kids liked it and asked their parents to bring them to church. It didn't happen all at once, but within a few years, 20 people became people of faith all because a preschooler went home one day and said, why don't we go to Sunday school? I have great hope for this church. I have confidence that with the next pastor, you will build on the momentum that we have, and you will make more new disciples for Jesus Christ. Jesus told those first fishermen, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Our calling is to follow Jesus and to bring others along as we learn to love God, grow in our love for each other, reach out in service to our community and share our faith with others. May we be true disciples and may we make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Amen.